Welcome to Safety Talk. Personal safety expert Pete Canavan shares his insights and interviews experts who provide simple and effective tips, techniques, and technologies to keep you safe and secure both online and off. Here's Pete. Hello, and welcome to Safety Talk. Today, we're going to talk about designing a security plan for schools and police and commercial environments. Your plan must include a video surveillance component, and this will be our focus with today's guest. So thanks so much to our listeners for being here. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite network or networks. And of course, check us out on our YouTube channel at safetytalkvideos.com. You do not want to miss an episode. From last week's episode on brain safety and last episode on disaster recovery to today's episode of It's Related to Safety, we bring you the experts on their respective topics and bring them to you. We appreciate you helping us spread the word, so be sure to spread the love. I'm your host and safety sensei, Pete Canavan, and my guest on this episode of Safety Talk is the Director of Global Training and Security Consulting for IP Video Corporation and True Security Design. IP Video has been around for decades, and they harness the power of the Internet of Things, IoT, and then incorporate artificial intelligence and machine learning to deliver a range of open platform physical security sensor and AV solutions. And really, it's amazing because it allows for maximum flexibility and performance, but also then enables ease of use and tremendous value to their users. So be sure to check them out. So today's guest, my pleasure to welcome Joseph Pangaro of IP Video Corporation to Safety Talk. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Pete. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. You know, it's an unpredictable world that seems to get less safe on a daily basis. And you know, it's, it's really of paramount importance that we get a handle on things first and foremost by being able to see things and then be able to harness the power of Internet of Things. And they're both critically important. And of course, training, you know, being able to, to train people on what they should do, what they shouldn't do, uh, which can be equally as important. Right. So let's uh, jump in with, uh, you know, let's start out by letting our listeners know a little bit about you and your background and how you got sort of involved in the safety and security industry. Sure, absolutely. Well, I spent 27 years in law enforcement. Uh, I worked my way uh, through the ranks. I spent most of my time in the investigative division. I got promoted up uh, to the rank of lieutenant, at which point, you know, you get all kinds of other jobs besides just locking up bad guys and bad girls. You have administrative duties. And one of the things I was put in charge of was liaisoning with Homeland Security to secure our schools, our malls, our businesses, uh, religious facilities. So I was trained by Homeland Security to conduct threat assessments and to, to train people. I'm FBI trained hostage crisis negotiator. So I do a lot of de-escalation work with law enforcement. And I did that for the last five or six years of my career. And then when I decided to retire, I said, where can I take my skill set? You know, where can I take all this information and, and do good? Because at that point, you know, you get a you get a police pension, you can make some choices. So right. I went to a large school district in New Jersey where I became the director of school safety and security. And I got to see what schools really needed from law enforcement, not just what law enforcement thinks the school needs. You know, we have a tendency to cop everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, We go in, you're going to do it like this and do it like that. And you don't really understand how the school works. So I spent five or six years as the director. And I had a a great relationship with with all the teachers, the staff, the administrators. And I got to help them actually really be safe to do things that really mattered, as opposed to, you know, the, the drills where you just check off a box and nobody really is any safer. But based on that experience, I started uh, I, I started teaching and training law enforcement officers in 2005. And then when I got to the schools, I, I could see what they needed. And I started creating a, a catalog of programs for the schools, uh, how to conduct a threat assessment in their school, how, how to identify potentially dangerous students before they attack us. Right. So we can intervene and keep people safe. Right. So I started doing that. And that, of course, branched out into uh, I got calls from companies that would say, hey, uh, we had a guy just come in and threaten us here. Uh, what would you do about that? So I went in and do an assessment for them, uh, teach them how to identify a threat, how to react to the threat, that kind of thing. Religious facilities, you know, every place where we are today, you can be attacked, which is unfortunate, but it's a reality. So that that kind of brought me um, to the end of my school career. And I started to continue doing this on my own. I created Pangaro Training. Pangaro training was picked up by the IP Video Corporation, and we have now uh, basically renamed what I do the uh, True Security Design Division of IP Video Corporation. 
So Excellent. IP video makes, uh, they make, like you said, a whole host of products, uh, the thing called the Halo, which is a smart sensor. It started out as a vape detector, and now it's an unbelievable piece of equipment. But I am actually the human side of safety and security for IP video corporation. They have a lot of uh, camera systems. They have visitor management systems, and I'm the human side of that. So that's kind of how I come to you today. They, uh, they, they bought my company, brought me in and said, hey, keep people safe. So that's what I do now nationwide. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, first of all, thanks for your service. I didn't know that 27 years in law enforcement and, you know, you put yourself out there and it's, it's a tough job and a thankless job sometimes. But uh, I know myself and all my listeners and, you know, any, everybody appreciates that. Uh, law enforcement's gotten a bad rap. It's been, you know, this whole defund movement that uh, was like a cancer in our society here. Uh, has really done damage to it. You know, I mean, you want somebody that's going to be the first person that's going to run in when there's a problem. You don't want them running the other way where when everyone else is running the other way, right? You got to right. go and deal with the threat. And, you know, active shooters you mentioned. And uh, so we, we could start with, with talking about that a little bit. I've had guests on, we've talked about active shooters. We've talked about, uh, you know, threat assessments and some of the other things. Now, we've seen, unfortunately, a, a rise in active shooters, uh, you know, nationwide and, Statistics wise, and, and one of my books is The Ultimate Guide to College Safety. And I know you've written some books too. We'll talk about that later. Uh, basically, the frequency of school shootings, uh, as of the last time they had statistics for it, was uh, approximately every three months. And an active shooter event they were defining as one with four or more deaths. So if you think about that, you know, every three months, basically once a quarter, we're started, we, we've seen this rise in active shooters. And my first question to you, Joseph, would be, why do you think that's happening? Because I know there's a lot of people that have different viewpoints on that. I've got my own viewpoints on that. I'd love to hear your, your view of that. Sure. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you saying, you know, uh, thank you for the service, because that is important to the men and women that are out there doing this. It's a tough job. And, and I always thank them and the military people whenever I see them, because, yes. you know, now they keep me safe. So, so thank you very much. The whole idea, when we look at active shooters, and when they define them as four or more dead, that kind of leaves out a lot of three and less dead uh, incidents right. that take place. And we used to look at the statistic and say genuine, real active shooters in schools were, were between 10 and 16 every year. That, you know, that was kind of the number that was out there. We see in 2020, the year 2020, there was 41 incidents. And in uh, you know, 2020, there was 40. So the number has really jumped and I think the, the part of this equation that we're looking at right now, this increase that we're seeing in active shooters, is due to the PTSD that I think we're all suffering because of these lockdowns. Uh, it seems very clear to me, uh, having kids that were in high school a couple of years ago before at the end of the pandemic, and how that affected them. And, and they're, my kids are all good. They're, they're smart young people, young men and women. But I could see how it affected their friend groups and their interactions. Absolutely. One of the things we know about active shooters, and I'm sure you know, is that there's no profile, but there are some traits. And one of those traits actually is when a kid does not feel connected to their school. They don't feel connected to their friends. They, they feel like an outside person. And it's easier to hurt someone that you're outside of than someone you're friendly with. And I think this lockdown has really affected every one of us to different levels. But our kids, I think, are when it comes back full time everywhere, it's going to be worse, I think. I wrote an article for Campus Safety Magazine in March or May of 2020, right after this started, you know, you know, 15, 15 days to, to lower the curve or whatever we were going to do. And it started to become clear to me that that's what was going to happen when these kids came back. And then we didn't come back for two years now. <laughs> so that's where I, I think we're going to see that. And workplace violence, same thing. People have been out of work. Now they're all tied up with this. I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be tough. And that's where we're going to see the increase. Yeah, I've, I've done workshops on workplace violence and how to spot it and how to deal with it. And um, we had a guest on, I forget what episode it was, but it was an awesome interview with someone who basically specialized in that sort of thing. Like they would be the mediator. So the company was like, hey, man, we got to we got to let this person go. But we're a little nervous. Would you come in and, and sit in the room, essentially, and mm -hmm. make sure that things go well? Uh, some people avoid it. Uh, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, fire somebody on a Friday that way to get the weekend to cool off. Uh, 
the best way to do it is not even have them in the office. You know, pick up the phone, call them on a weekend and say, you know, we'll send you your stuff. Don't even let them back in the office because that gives them the opportunity to think about it and be like, oh, OK, I'm going to I'm going to come in there and I'll teach them who's boss, you know, and, and and all these. And I think the PTSD, what you were mentioning, Joseph, is absolutely a huge contributor to this because of the the lack of social interaction. And for those people that don't have a strong social network, it makes it very, very difficult for them. I'm lucky. I, I live on a cul-de-sac with a lot of cool neighbors. And all throughout the pandemic, we were still hanging out. We were still doing everything together. We were socially distanced, but we'd have a fire pit in the middle of the cul-de-sac. We'd have space heaters out there. We'd be bundled up and, and hanging out and drinking some beers and still interacting with each other. And so the isolation won't affect people like that, like myself and my friends, as much as some other people, but not everybody has that network of friends. Not everybody has the, maybe the comfort level that would be necessary to do that sort of thing. You know, we're all, we're all scared out of our minds in the beginning. Like, Oh my God, you can't be around anybody. You got a distance. You got to wear your mask. Oh my God, this is the worst thing in the world. We know since then that, that isn't the case. We've learned a ton since then, but in the younger population who is much more vulnerable it's definitely affecting them uh, to a much greater extent. And uh, sure. that, that's a huge thing, like you said. And, and you can see it because we see the development of young people. You know, someone your age, my age, we have friends. We, we, we functioned as well, too. We got together with people safely. We did it. Mm -hmm. But we also know, I'm sure you know some people that are still to this moment are panicked out of their minds and they cannot function mm -hmm. uh, because of the fear they have. Uh, of of going to they're going to get it they're going to die they're going to pass it on to someone and, and I get that you know it's it's a real virus it, it hurts people but we see that fear and panic and now that we're lifting this mask mandate everywhere um you're seeing people still afraid to do it. so that it's that fear and with the kids that isolation from their friends that that growth network where they can be who they are they can learn who what they're all about they connect with without that that isolation is one of the main things we see over and over again with people who attack especially kids that attack. You know, if you think of any movie you ever watched with hostages, you know, I do hostage crisis negotiating and mm -hmm. they, you always see there's always one smart person in the room that'll say to the killer, hey, listen, my name is Muriel and I have three kids at home, uh, uh, you know, and this is who I am. And the reason that that that's written in there is because if you don't know someone personally, it's much easier to hurt them. But if right. I know that now you're a mom, you're a dad, you have a kid, it's a, now it's more difficult for me to attack you. Uh, and that's where that's because that's connection human connection is really, no matter whether you like people or don't like people, that's how we function mostly in society. And without that, uh, you get some grievances, you get some problems. And I, and I liked you know, what you're saying about uh, they're going to fire somebody. It amazes me. Every time I see an employee come back and kill the manager and seven other people, why would they let that person back in the door? Why wasn't there a policy that says, hey, listen, Bob has been removed. If he shows up at the door, do not let him in. You know, call somebody before you hit the button or let them walk in the front door. Do you secure your facility at all? Right. Uh, in this in this day and age, a guy makes threats and then you fire him. You have to anticipate in this day and age, he might come back and hurt you. So why would you let him in the building? You know, yep. what, what do if we you don't have the proper security, about? like you said, or surveillance to see what's going on? You're asking for trouble. And that's a scary thing. You know, well, and, I, I think Pete, the, what I hear and you probably hear, too, because you do this, the most dangerous thing anybody can ever say. Oh, it won't happen here. We're good. It won't happen in my place. <laughs> right. That is the most dangerous Precise. statement anybody could ever make. Because I, I, when I go out and I lecture, no matter what group it is, I ask this question every time. I say, can anybody tell me when and where the next active shooter is going to take place? Just just don't hold back. Raise your hand and tell me because Lieutenant Joe is going to go there and I'm going to be a hero when they show up. And in 15 years of asking that question, no one has ever raised their hand. So we would say, oh, it's statistically, it's such a small chance. And it is mm -hmm. small, small chance you'd ever be involved. But when we look at it that way, the reality is it happens to you or it doesn't. So you better be prepared. That's the reality of it. And I, you know, and one of the things that people say that are that are survivors of such an, a, you know, a, a terrible catastrophe, whether it's an active shooter or something else uh, it could be a robbery, identity theft, whatever. What does every single person say afterwards? I never thought it would happen to me. And we're here to tell people it, it is going to happen to you. You know, don't think maybe it'll happen to you. If you switch your mindset to make it an inevitability, 
you're going to change your attitude and your response and your preparation for that sort of an event. And so don't put your head in the sand. Don't think that's ah, not going to happen to me because that's exactly what every single person thought before there was a, an incident, whether it was a workplace violence shooting or active shooter or like I said, you know, anything, you know, identity theft or a cyber attack, mm -hmm. you know, you think, oh, my business is too small. It, it, why would somebody, you know, t take the time and energy to, to target me? Well, we're seeing much more sophisticated attacks. We're seeing much more targeted attacks with spear phishing against specific individuals that have been identified by a rogue actor as a high value target, for example. These are things that you've got to be prepared for. And if you're not, it's bad. My wife's a teacher. Okay, She teaches second grade. You're talking about kids and how this has affected them and the PTSD part of this. It is crazy because these kids have lost over a year. Now, she teaches second grade. When this school year started, of course, I was still masked. Thank God they got rid of them recently. But the kids lost over a year of instruction. So they were coming to her almost like they were just out of kindergarten. A lot of them couldn't read. A lot of them couldn't, didn't know the alphabet, their numbers. They're you know, way far behind. And then when you have something in front of a teacher's face like this and the kids can't see how the mouth moves, how are they supposed to properly learn how to form words and speak? You can't do it. And it's, very, it's, it's been so frustrating for her and so frustrating for the kids. And they're the ones that are suffering. And it, it's, it's damaged an entire generation. Of course, you know, educationally, but now, of course, psychologically, right? I mean, as we were just Absolutely. saying. Yep. And that, and that is scary. You know, when you, even when you did that, when you put your hand in front of your mouth there, I lost a lot of the connection to you because, you know, 80% of human interaction and communication is through body language and facial expression. Right. When you cut that off, you're a whole different person. And I perceive you differently. I perceive what you say differently. It, you kind of think of it. Remember when, when email first started, I'm old enough to remember when email first started Oh yeah. and you wanted to really make your point. So you, you wrote it in capitals, but people took that as though you were screaming at them. Right. You know, it's the perception because they didn't see you face to face. So understanding that getting rid of these masks, these kids are all going to have various levels of this. And when they come back, kids that would I think really the premise of my article for campus safety was kids that would have never been on the radar before as dangerous may now be additional kids we have to worry about. So we have to really understand how to identify the things that people do and say, whether it's workplace violence or whether it's, it's kids in a school, these things don't happen in immediate. We don't wake up on Tuesday and say, I think I'll go kill 12 kids in my school. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't work like that. They think about it. They, they have, uh, they say things, they write things, they go on social media, they draw things. I do a whole program on drawings on what the, how do you interpret when these kids draw something? What does it mean? And I've taught that to teachers and, and, you know, first you get inundated after you teach the program, every picture they see, they snap and send to you. And I don't mind that, Right. but I got a couple of them that were actually truly frightening uh, that I went and did an interview with this, this one young man, a freshman in high school that drew this horrific set of pictures and in the middle was a cart, you know, stick figures. That's how the kid drew. He wasn't an artist. But in the middle was a person laying there with X's in their eyes. And the rest of you see some shooting people. And all. And I talked to the kid, you know, who are these people? Oh, these people don't like me. I don't like them. I'm, I, I didn't want to hurt them and this and that. And I said, and who's that in the middle? And he said, that's me. When I get done with them, I'm going to kill myself. Oh, my God. That was a shooter right there. That kid was on that line and he was removed from the school that day and he got counseling and he, he didn't come back to the district. But that was probably the scariest thing I had ever seen, because that that is the kid. There he is. He's totally isolated from everybody. He wants to hurt people and he wants to take himself out because the pain is so great. And we can we can see these things many, many, many times before they happen. And then we have to be prepared to intervene. And when you and say that's the key, here, you won't. that's the key, Joseph, we have to be prepared to intervene. And I think that's the biggest problem is people that do see some of this, whether it's a peer or a friend or a teacher, they're hesitant to say something because they're like, well, what if I'm wrong and it's OK? Or, you know, they just they don't want to take the responsibility for speaking out in, in you know, because maybe they're they're afraid of how somebody's going to react to that. Better safe than sorry. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but you've got to make sure that you don't ignore these things. And unfortunately, a lot of active shooters in the past have posted things online, whether they're manifestos or drawings or just crazy, bizarre statements. There has there's a pattern and there's there's kind of like a trail of breadcrumbs that after these events, you go back and you follow them backwards. You're like, man, the signs were there. How could we miss them? And right. maybe we, they were missed. 
maybe they were ignored, which is worse. And, and that's the thing because people, my experience with them, when I go in and I say, okay, they want me to do a threat assessment on the school. Well, now let's go to the next level. Let me train your staff to review a threat, whether it's a social media threat, a drawing, a writing, something somebody says, a kid comes to you and says, Bob has a kill list, whatever it is. How do you respond to that threat? And what you get all the time is, well, you know, we would know it if we saw it. And, you know, you really can't prevent these. No, you can. There's a, there's yep. a concept of leakage. All right. So leakage is where someone who's going to do something like this, they start to, it starts to leak out and it can leak out in many ways. Right. They can go on and say something. Oh, I, I hate, I hate all of you. They can do a kill list. We start to see in the clothing that a lot of these shooters, whether adults or kids start to wear. If you start to notice uh, the Columbine kids, they had BDU kind of pants, military pants. They had the hats, the gloves, the boots, mm-hmm. the guy in, uh, in Virginia tech, he put out the videos and he was wearing the, the gun uh, jacket and he had the, the BDUs and all of that. We see the kid in, in, in Sandy Hook, uh, this kid all dressed in black and he went there. The guy in Dallas that shot up all those people in law enforcement officers a couple of years ago, regular guy. And here he is dressed up like he's Johnny the Army man, because part of the mindset is they're going to war. And what do we do? We see it on TV. That's how you dress. You prepare yeah. yourself. That's leakage. You put the so camo you start to see a kid wearing, the, yes, the yeah, camo. For people that don't know that. what BDUs are, battle dress uniform. The, you know, the big pockets right. in the pants yeah. and you can the stuff all pants. your magazines and, and yep. you know, ammo and whatever else, you know, b- makeshift bombs, whatever. You can stuff a lot of stuff in those pants. Yep. So it's, uh, yeah, so it's that, very interesting one of the because they want to dress the part. They're dressing the part because in their mind, they're going to go to battle. So you got to get dressed for battle because that's what they see in the video games. That's what they see in the movies. That's what they see on TV. And we, we can see these things when, when somebody makes a threat, you know, uh, you talk about like at the workplace, you actually hit on it right there. Why? There's two reasons when we look afterwards, we do the investigation. Turns out some, if not many people knew that that kid was going to do something bad, but they don't come forward with kids. Number one, they don't want to be a rat. Right. They don't want to be a rat who tells on somebody. And what if I'm wrong? Because what do we do? I, I go to the principals. Hey, listen, uh, Pete's got this kill list. I'm really scared of that. They go get Pete and they say, hey, Joe says you got to kill this. They involve me. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be involved in that. Just go do your investigation. Right. So th- afterwards they come for, oh, yeah, we knew he was dangerous. Workplace. Well, he used to say things all the time. <laughs> well, that's the way Bob is. Bob's talking about gun. You know what? Let them write me up one more time and this whole place is going to be sorry. Yeah. Now, is, is that a threat on people's lives? Well, if the cops show up, my brother and sister show up, they go, well, what do they do? Who do they threaten? Well, he, he said he was, he said he was, we're going to all be sorry. Well, what's that mean? Right. So we have to look deeper into the words. People veil their words. They parse their words because they know maybe they'll call the cops. I never said I was going to kill anybody. Right. And then they come back and they kill people. Right. So we have to identify that threat, look at what it might be, and then take some action. And, and it's just amazing that at this day and age, people haven't learned that lesson. How many times do we have to go through this that we don't learn the lesson and say, okay, what can we do if there's a threat and really do something? And that's exactly right. What can we do? And I'm going to go back to something else you hit on too, but uh, what can we do as individuals? And then I want to ask you kind of a broader question, but as individuals, what can people do? I mean, keep, keep their, their awareness, you know, at a heightened level, I would say, what, what would you say we can do as individuals to hopefully spot and prevent these things? Sure. I think first thing is to realize that while the chances are very low, it can happen to you. It can happen to you. So therefore, situational awareness is the key. I go to church. My wife and I, we go every Sunday to church. And I go to church and I sit there and I look around and I say, well, our church is targets. They are. So where would I sit? I would sit over here so that if something happened, I could maybe react to the person. You know, former law enforcement, I'm allowed to carry a weapon. Mm-hmm. So if something were to happen, I'm in a position. So you think ahead of time. Funny story. I taught, um, I taught my company people. I did a program for them on active shooter response. What happens if you're there, right? And they all took it pretty well. Okay, that's what we would do. We could do. About two years ago, there was an active shooter in Arizona, and he was outdoors. And the guy that was in my program, one of the employees from my company, was there with his wife. And they're probably their late 50s. And they're sitting there having their lunch on a beautiful day. And all of a sudden, they hear these funny popping sounds, right? Right. Funny popping, because that's what people describe them mm-hmm. afterwards. What I say to everybody, unless you work in a fireworks factory, you shouldn't be hearing funny popping sounds. If you do, you have to assume 
that could be gunfire and take some action. Right. Right. So he hears this and his wife says, oh, what's that? You think you think it's a parade or something? And he's like, uh, no, no, I, don't, I think we better go. And she's like, what do you mean? Well, they climbed over like a three foot concrete wall. She's complaining to him. They got around the corner and the guy with the AR-15 came around the other side and lit up the tables and lit up the whole place. Oh. And he says, I only got out of there because I heard funny popping sounds. And you said, unless it's a fireworks factory, I should go. And my wife didn't want to go. And we survived because of it. So Amazing. to answer your question, situational awareness, pay attention. Something doesn't seem right. Move, get up and go. You can come back and finish your sandwich. You can come back and shop later. Pay attention to what's going on around you. If it doesn't look right, it probably not. I like to even take that a step further. And I incorporate talking about routines and comfort zones as well, because comfort zones are a very dangerous thing because we get stuck in a routine, right? We walk our dog down the same block. We go shopping at the same stores. We do this. We go to the same route to the same gym every day, right? So when things are routine, we get complacent and we get complacent. We, we're, we're in this, this comfort zone, right? Where we, we think what's happening today is what happened yesterday. And we think what's going to happen tomorrow is the same thing that happened today. So it's very, very dangerous. And so the awareness level drops where we should have that certain level of, of situational awareness, as you're saying, you, you, you definitely need that, but we get so complacent and complacency is dangerous. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you can't walk around being paranoid. You know, you right. don't walk around like every minute you're going to die. It's just be aware that it could happen at any time. Any, we could be in a library, in a movie theater, at a restaurant, sitting outside. You, got, you have to be prepared. If you hear something, something sounds out of place, something doesn't look right. You have to ask yourself, is this a potential danger? Not just, oh, it's nothing. And don't ignore well, A lot it. of people that said it's nothing are gone. They're not here anymore. Right. So we, we have to pay attention. So you're 100 percent correct. Is, yeah, you it's can't that ignore situational it. awareness and and just be pay attention to what's going on. And if it don't feel right, if you think you hear something, you know, just get up and go. Just get up and go. That's what you get. You teach people. That's what I try and say. Uh, you know, as a cop, we used to go. I go into a food store or something, and my wife knew if I gave her the signal, I saw something. She might not see it. She might not understand what I see, but I'm giving her the signal. Get the kids and get out of here mm -hmm. because something might happen here. Right. Well, it's right. the same kind of thing. You get that that uh, that spider sense that goes off. Uh, something's not right. Pay attention to that. Sure. And that's where if you're in a routine and you're not, you don't have that heightened sense of awareness and you're expecting things to be the same, they may not be one day. And so even like in terms of our comfort levels, right? If you, if I take, you know, somebody who, well, they fall asleep in their bed at night, Right. They're very comfortable there. They've been sleeping in that bed every night for however many years, right? Same room, same house, same bed, et cetera. And I come into your house in the middle of the night and I take you out of that bed and I go and I put you in another bed three states over without you waking up and you wake up, you're going to freak out. Are you in any danger? Not necessarily, no. But I have taken you way out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And now you're way more aware. You're like, oh my God, where am I? What's going on? You may or may not be in any danger, but because the comfort zone has been eliminated, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. it, it changes the perspective in a big, big way. And so that's where having that awareness of being too comfortable mm -hmm. is also important in helping keep people safe because yep. it's, it's I, I agree. Thing. It's, it's a matter of, of keeping, keeping your head about you. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you get on a train. You know, nowadays you get on a train somewhere, there could be somebody on there that's dangerous. And you start to see them saying things and doing things. And ah, I guess they're all right. Or an airplane. How many of us now get on an airplane and look around? Who's on the plane with us? Oh, yeah. Right. Because you know what? They're not taking Joe into a building. I'm prepared ahead of time. I'm not I'm not going to stand for that. Now, is that going to happen again? Probably not. But the reality is you could have people at attack the cabin of the airplane still. Not if I'm on that plane. Right. Because yes. I'm preparing myself. I see somebody starting to get bocky and they're giving those people a hard time going to that cabin. I have to do something. I might not win the, the, the battle, but I'm going to do something and I'm prepared mentally to see something and, and do something, whether that be run, take off out of there or to take some kind of action, which, you know, you have to really consider what you're going to do uh, when you do it. You get yourself you can get yourself hurt bad. But you're right. It's, it's that comfort zone. When you, you said say, something key right there, too, is, is the mindset. Because you have to be able to flip that switch from being, you know, Mr. Nice Guy to you shouldn't have messed with me guy. 
yeah. and you're, you're, you're putting me at risk now and you've got to act on that and not freeze up. And without thinking about this stuff ahead of time, and I do trainings on this called the warrior mindset. And it basically teaches people how to go over, under, around, or through any obstacle that stands in their way. It could be in life. It could be in business. It could be a survival situation. It could be in a relationship. It doesn't matter. But you have to have the mindset of somebody who is a survivor, right? That's going to never give up, you know, kind of like, you know, the warriors of ancient Japan, the samurai, right? They were given a job. They knew they may die doing it, but they went and they did it anyway because they knew they had to. And we have to be sort of the same. And it's, it can be scary, but at the same time, would you rather just sit there and not do anything? Or would you rather at least go down fighting? And I know me and you, obviously, just like you said, you're going to go down fighting because you have something to live for. You have something to fight for. And you know that you have to act when the time calls for it. And it's, it's tough because it all starts up here in your brain, in your mind. You know, you could teach somebody the coolest thing in the world to do in terms of a technique whether it's a, a survival technique, a shooting technique, a self-defense technique like I do. But if they can't bring themselves to do it, it's useless. You know, what right. good is it? You're, 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 you're dialed in 100%. I think we're, we're absolutely on the same wavelength here. It, one of the things that I say all the time, because you're teaching different groups of people. When I teach cops, they're used to doing dangerous stuff. They're, you know, they're used to, okay, I'll react. I'll do this and that. When you're dealing with school personnel, when you're dealing with people in businesses, they're not used to wrestling around with somebody, fighting somebody. Somebody has a gun. What do you do? Right. Maybe they're, if they're afraid of guns, they don't want like seeing guns. It scares them. And you have to understand what I say to them is you don't want the first time you have to react to something be the first time you thought about it. Because if that happens... You're done because there's fight, right. flight, and there's also freeze. And lots of people will freeze when they see that, that danger perception. So when I, when I teach uh, school personnel and you go through that run, hide, fight kind of a thing with them, what should they do? How could they get out? What to, how to protect the kids? And it gets to the, to the fight part, you know, to fight for your life. You know, if, that, if that's the mindset you're talking, if you don't understand that, if you don't get that, you're, you're going you're gonna to fold when you really need to fight. You may not survive the conflict. But it's better to fight, go down fighting. So when I teach them that, I try and say, you got to understand, this is a moment that you have to react. Because even when I teach cops, you know, if somebody got their gun or took possession of them, the best time to fight is right there in that moment. Because once we, human psychology tells us, once we're overpowered and we feel we're overpowered, now we're going to be submissive, right? So if I don't fight that very first minute, um, I may not be able to fight. So I tell my wife and my daughter and my, my boys, too, if somebody ever jumped in your car, don't go take the ride, crash the car. Right. And my daughter said, well, what if, what if he had a gun? I said, um, I don't think he really wants to kill you. But if you take a ride into those hills, you're not coming back. So crash the car. Right. right? You've got a seatbelt. They probably don't. Maybe they go flying through the windshield. Your airbag is going to go off. I tell people the same thing. Yep. Crash the car. You know, so it's it is that mindset ahead of time. Um the time a to prepare, story. that's what I say all the time. The time to prepare is before the need arises. Yes. Because and, and, when you have the need, it's everything. too late. Right. Because you don't want to be thinking about it then. What, what should I do now? Well, have a little bit of a plan. If you're going to go somewhere, where would you go? When you're at, you know, okay, if something happened at the mall, do I know where the exits are? Simple stuff, not paranoid. If mm -hmm. something happened on the airplane, where would I go? What could I do? Right. So it, it is thinking ahead. And that's all preparedness. You know, and we when have a we're hurricane prepared, that's come through and destroy us. Did we plan on what we would do if the hurricane came, right? Or the tornado or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to be prepared. And it's scary. Some of it's scary. But, but the, 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 the nice is, part about being prepared, though, is it reduces your stress levels. And that's exactly. what people don't understand. They're like, well, I don't want to think about it. It's like, no, 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 no. You need to think about it because guess what? If you know what to do in a situation, mm -hmm. whether it's a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, like an active shooter or workplace violence, you're going to be much more prepared because you're going to know what to do because you've thought about it ahead of time. Hopefully you've trained for it ahead of time so that when that situation happens, and I always tell people when, not if, mm -hmm. you change that little switch. That's like, well, if it happens, no, when it happens makes it definitive. And now it makes it more concrete. And so you like think about it a different way. And yep. so that is when you have the ability to now do things in a way that you, your, your level, your chances of surviving that go way, way up. Absolutely. What I, what I say in the line I use, because I, I stole this from the teachers, when you understand, you know, in that educational world, I say, I know this is scary, 
But by the time we're done talking about this, I'm going to empower you to survive. You're going to be empowered to survive. Yes. And that's what you need. That's how you have this chance. So a, a real quick, funny story. I taught everybody in this municipal building because uh, they had had some problems with people showing up and being upset. So I taught all of them how to survive an active shooter, violent person. Then we did an actual drill. You know, we went in, we sent the guy in waving a gun and everyone had to go lock down. And then I froze it when it was done and I checked where everybody was. I said, oh, you're under the desk. Good job. Oh, you people are locked in the closet. When I got to the tax office, it was a, a like 25 by 25 room, one way in, one way out, and three older women worked in there. And their cubicles all over. And I, I got in. I said, ladies, where are you? So we're back here, Lieutenant Joe. I said, don't move. Let me see what you did. So I go back and I'm talking to these ladies and they're standing there. And all three of them got these metal pipes in their hand. And I said, what are you doing? They said, well, you told us to get out if we could get out. We can't get out of here. It's one door. You said to hide if we could. Well, I'm not getting under that desk. So we had a fight. So we're ready to fight. And I said, wow. Awesome. That was, that, they thought it. I said, that's great. I said, where'd you get the pipes? They said, oh, we brought them from home like you told us. I said, oh, <laughs> be very clear. Lieutenant Joe did not tell you to bring weapons to the workplace. But they took it seriously is the point. Yeah. They heard the message and they said, we can't get out of here. We can't get under these desks. We're going to fight. And they brought these pipes in, put them behind the safe in the corner, and they were ready to fight for their life. That That's tremendous. alone might save their lives. And they, I'm sure they passed that on to their friends. Mm -hmm. And that's the preparedness you're talking about. You know, you, you have to think about it in advance and think, what would I do? Because if you, you fight, you flight, or you freeze. And if you freeze, your, your odds are gone that you're going to survive. Yeah. And, you know, and that's what the, a lot of times that's how you uh, you train, right? The run, hide, fight. Um in my, in my book, The Ultimate Guide to College Safety, which is a comprehensive book on, on you know, geared towards college students, but I mean, it has stuff in there for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I've even updated a bit to be avoid, deny, defend, because you can, you can run, but if you can avoid that somehow and get out, right, you focus on where it is that you want to go and you think about it, it's like, okay, I need to run, but where am I running to? You know, oh, that's where I need to run to. I need to run to that stairwell. And, and it, it helps them focus a little bit. And, you know, so I, they have to have that exit plan and have that ahead of time. And then of course the, uh, you know, hiding or denying access, right. Blocking the doors, propping things up there to deny access and hide and, you know, be quiet, obviously turn the phones off and all of that. And then of course, fight or defend, you know, and fight for your life. And the first book I ever wrote is called the self-defense survival guide, how to fight when you're fighting for your life. And that's exactly what the subtitle is because mm -hmm. you need to understand that there's no such thing as a fair fight when you're fighting for your life. You want to be the person that goes and gets home to your family. And the person that messed with you is going to regret it. And that's the mindset you have to have. And it's tough mm -hmm. for people to get into that, especially if they've never thought about it. So one of the first things I teach every new student that comes into our martial arts school and self-defense classes is I talk about mindset, awareness, comfort zones, and routines before I teach them a single technique. And they're Absolutely. like, well, why are we talking about this? I'm like, because no matter what I teach you, if you can't bring yourself to do it, it's useless. So You're we're going to talk right. about what you need to do to be able to flip that switch and go from, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Nice guy to Mr. and Mrs. You shouldn't have messed with me guy or girl. Right. Which is why, why do we practice for years fire drills? So if there was a fire, the kids would know what to do. Why do we do lockdowns with these kids? Mm -hmm. So that if something happens, they react, the teachers react, people know what to do. They're not waiting for instruction and I'm freaking out. What should I do? They know what to do. Close the door, pull down a curtain, lock the window, get in the corner, get the, whatever it is that they're, they're trained to do. Uh, they do it because they practiced it. It becomes second nature because we thought about it. How could we respond to this? Learn from past experiences, you know, the historical record of every one of these events, no matter it's a workplace shooting or, or violence or, or school shooting, or whatever, it's packed with lessons for us mm -hmm. that we, we can look at. Who survived? How did they survive? What did they do? Let's look at those individual stories because you might be in that position one day. Maybe right. you can learn from that, right? Um, sure. it, goes, it goes to akin to uh, one thing that always really scared me when I was younger was my car going into the water and the idea of going down with that car. Because you think the car is going to float and then you realize cars don't float. They sink. <laughs> right. What do you have to do? Well, I'll break the window. Do you ever try and break a car window with your hand? You're not going to do it. No. Nope. So they tell you, roll the window down as the car is sinking. Who's going to be doing that? You're scared right. to death. Right. But if you don't do that, you ain't getting out of that car. Right. Or, or you, you have one of those tool to glass break break You got to have a tool, right? You got to have a tool, but you better know how to do that. You better have broken a window or two practicing, or you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to be understanding. You're going to be under such panic and such fear. So when I teach cops to go to active shooter events, 
first of all, it's a complete different mindset than what people think cops are really trained to do. They think, you know, cops are trained to shoot to kill and, and they're not. Uh, we, we go crazy trying to teach our cops restraint, restraint, restraint. And when it came to active shooters, we realized these are these are different people. These are different mm -hmm. events. So if you you have to go to the sound of the shooting, we started with four cops, four cops show up and then go in. Well, then we realized we can't wait for four, That's maybe right. three or two. Now we know first good guy or good girl gun on the scene has to go to that shooting. You roll up and the shooter decides to surrender. Good. Take him into custody. They lock themselves in a closet. Good. Secure them. They don't stop shooting, apply deadly force immediately. That is brand new to law enforcement. That's not what we train cops to do. Right. You you know, we stop train the them threat. to defend themselves. Now we're teaching them you have to do this. And it's a totally different mindset for them. Uh, what Some happens, can't you know, do it. I mean, there was a one situation, I forget what school was, where the guy showed up and he didn't go in. Parkland. Park, yeah. Is that Parkland what it was? High school. And, and it was like, what, do you, what the heck, man? You're sitting there. And meanwhile, innocents are, are being killed and you have the capability potentially of stopping that and, and limiting the damage and the carnage and the death. So, yeah. like you said, it's it's maybe a little against the, the initial training of law enforcement officers. But by the same token, you, you have an obligation, you have a, a, a need to go in and do that. But it takes a special kind of person It takes a special sort of mindset that's been trained to do that. In order to mm -hmm. be, because knowing that you might go in there and be killed, you know, most right, people, absolutely. if they, if they think they're going to go in there and they got the potential to be, to be shot or killed, they're going to think twice about it. I don't care how much training you have. Right. And this is when I, when I teach these young cops, uh, I'm trying to tell them, I say, this might, this might be the call you go on where, uh, your, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your mother, your father might get that nice folded up flag because you are a hero, but you got to go. So mm -hmm. we did a, uh, we did a uh, we assisted with a university doing a uh, a real role player based active shooter event, and two guys came from my department, two from another, and three from the college, and they set up this beautiful stereo system in the dorm with gunshots that shook the building, sounded like the real thing. I mean, it was good, and the two guys from my town were both on the county SWAT team. One was a sergeant, and we set this thing off, and these guys come running up, and I'm monitoring what they're doing. The sergeant takes the team, goes up the stairs and the shots start going and he pushes everybody up against the wall. And he stood there and he's listening and he's watching. And I had to lean over and say, Sarge, aren't you aren't you supposed to go to those gunshots? And he looked at me with a panic look and he ran down there and then did what he had to do. And later on, he was devastated. He says, I could only think with those gunshots going off to protect my people. I said, that's not your job. If you didn't see that bad guy in the hallway shooting at you. You are to run to the sound of the gunshots. This mm -hmm. is dangerous work. That's why we practice. Well, he was devastated that he did that. I had to so much so that we had to do a, another local program not soon thereafter so that he was put in that position again and he could function because we have to function past our mistakes. Right. And this time he ran right in and I know he felt much better. But you, you see that with anything. I, I teach cops undercover stuff and they, oh, I can do undercover. And then they get in there with role players and they freeze. One guy asked, I'd like to buy some narcotics. You know, and the actors threw him right out of the house. He was devastated. <laughs> At the end, I had to say, I'm sending this guy in again. You let him buy anything he wants to buy because I can't have him going out of here that he, he, he's, he's a mess. And he went in and he says, I, I just I thought I could do it, but I didn't give it enough consideration. And that's practice, 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 mindset. Get yourself ready. Walk. I, I would call it talk, walk and run. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Then we walk through whatever it is we're concerned about. And then we do it for real. Go, right? Talk, walk, and run. That's how you're going to learn. And we have to do that with all of this stuff, with everybody that we deal with. So uh, I like I'm glad that. to know you're out there too, trying to <laughs> trying to do the right thing. So, you know, what, so to try to sort of mitigate these problems going forward and try to, you know, slow it down because, you know, we're never going to probably eliminate this sort of thing. What can society do? And I think more importantly, and, you know, probably get a little flack for this, but what can industries do like Hollywood and the gaming industries? Because those, I think, are two big industries that are making people numb to the fact that, you know, it's easy to shoot people. It's, you know what I mean? Because a lot of this stuff is glorified or it's normalized or it's become so commonplace that, it it causes certain people to be numb. So what 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 do we do there, or what can or what should certain industries like the gaming industry and like Hollywood do to to help people 
you know, not have to deal with this sort of thing going forward. That's, that's a, that's a, a really complex thing to kind of consider. I mean, <laughs> I, sure watched Bugs, <laughs> I watched Bugs Bunny drop rocks on people. I never did that. I watched uh, movies, cop movies where people shot people up and bad guys shot people. I never went out and shot people up. I, mm-hmm. I never had that thought. Can it push somebody that's on the edge to see that, that that's maybe that's something I can do. Is that in the culture? I mean, all these kids playing all these video games, are they desensitized to shooting people? I think there probably think so. is some of that. I think there probably is some of that where if you get a kid who's uh, mentally over the edge to do something like this, that this is what they've decided is, is a reasonable response to whatever uh, problems they're having. They probably played a lot of the video games and they're used to acquiring targets. And sh- we use these in our military. They use virtual reality training for our, our, our military people. Law enforcement is using it now. The reality is <clears throat> it's spotting the danger before it happens. Right. Because Hollywood, don't don't use guns in your movies. Why do we all go to those movies? Why do we like Dirty Harry? And why do we like all these? Because it's exciting. It's adventurous. Why do cop movies and cop stories and books and radio shows? Why do they sell like crazy? Because it's exciting and it's dangerous. And we all want to you know, get out of our boring life and have a little excitement. Right. So I don't know how much they can actually do, um, but I think it's up on the rest of us, businesses, schools. Anywhere where people are going to gather, if you're responsible for that, make sure you understand the signs and the the symptoms that you're getting. When you have somebody who's making commentary, you have to take action. If you have a kid that's doing some things, writing things, you have to intervene. And that is where we can try and get people help. Because you know what? And this is tough to say, but a kid goes in and shoots 12 kids in school. He ruined 12 lives and his own. And if we could have intervened before that, before all those people were killed and that kid ruined his life or her life, that would be a good thing because, you know, most of these people are not evil. They're bad. They have a bad idea in their head and they, they do terrible, terrible things to us. But if we could save everybody, that would be the thing to do. And we do that by taking it seriously, getting the mindset that, hey, uh, it couldn't happen here. Yes, it could. And we have to do something to prepare ourselves. That's really, I think, the best to answer your question as best as I can, because mm-hmm. they're not going to stop making those movies. The gamers are not going to stop making these ridiculous games. How about the parents? Don't let the kid you know, play the game where they're running around shooting prostitutes in the street. Maybe you say, no, uh, Junior, you're yeah. 12. You can't do that. Um, and that you know, I think is and that's a that right there is a problem, because, I mean, I have three sons and two of the three have played those games and I had many shall we say spirited conversations with my wife over it (laughs) because I was, I didn't want that at at, at a certain age, right? There there are ages where you you shouldn't have access to some of these games when you're nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. It's too young to have some of these graphic games being played. I mean, when you're a little bit older, teenagers, 16, 17, 18, it's, probably still doing a little something up there where you're being desensitized to some of this stuff. But I mean, if you're healthy, if you've got a good family environment, you got a good support system, you got a good, you know, uh, they're good people around you. The chances of that evolving into something really bad and evil are low, still a chance, but it's Mm -hmm. low. But on the flip side, if you do not have a good support system, if you're alienated, if you spend so much time in this and not interacting with people in the real world and playing sports or, or going to you know, events and things with other people, you can see where that isolation can sort of set in and where these sort of things can begin to maybe plant ideas in people's heads. And, it, and it's a really scary thing to, to think about it. Um, so I, I do want to show... Uh, the uh, those that are watching this on YouTube, the website, uh, because you have this uh, this website has got a bunch of different things on here. We'll take a quick look at it, um, and it'll talk about some of the, the hazard threat assessment stuff you do. And, and we're gonna have to probably wrap with that because time's a flying here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we get to talking, and uh, you talk start talking shop. It goes quick. Yeah, uh, good stuff. So we're going to let me uh, share. This screen here, people should be able to see. You should be able to see that now, Joe, right? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so this is the IP video website here. And uh, you had mentioned earlier this Halo device, which I think is very interesting. This is a vape detector and an air quality device. Tell us a little bit about uh, this here. This is absolutely an amazing, this is a game changer 
for so many, so many of our concerns we have. I've watched uh, outside my office, I watched the R&D team put this thing together and it started out as a vape detector. It could pick up vape uh, in, in the air and vape with THC. Well, since oh. then uh, it's gone into, it's got a gunshot detector in it. It's got a, uh, a call for help. So you can come up with a keyword, um, whatever you want to say, you know, uh, help halo. And it sends out text messages and emails to whoever you want and gives your location. Um, they're working on it now where it's going to have a two-way uh, speaker. So you can call for something. Somebody can advise you. Um, they, oh, have, wow. uh, they have connected to BACnet now in, in build buildings where they can do uh, volatile chemicals. Uh, it's an early smoke detector. It detects smoke before smoke detector. It picks up um, so very the chemicals low parts that are in the air, air the pressure in the air. So you, you, if you have low pressure, all of a sudden, you know, we want our buildings to be positive pressure now. Get the COVID out, blow the COVID out. So this can keep track of the, the pressure in your building. It tells you to go up and down, sends people notices. Wow. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. So you can program it to uh, notify whoever you want it to notify. It's really an amazing thing. And you can, uh, they go into uh, so many different markets now. It used to be schools. Now it's businesses, uh, airplanes for air quality, uh, just about any location where you're concerned about all of these things, temperature, humidity, particles, noise. It can tell occupancy now. How many people are in a room? Wow, you can look at the that's halo incredible. and it can tell you how many people are in that room. So that could be a good safety device. How many people are in that room before we have to go in or whatever? Um, Very it's just cool. absolutely amazing. And now they have a cloud backup for this where all your data goes to the cloud and you can recover at any time. You can look at it at any time. Uh, you can find trending situations. Uh, say you got a meat locker. You got to keep your meat at minus 32 degrees and it goes to 35 degrees. It sends out messages. You go there, you fix the six, you don't lose all the stuff. Absolutely an amazing device. And it's only going to continue to grow. Really. A wow. Beautiful that has product. a ton of features that it has in there. And that's got its own website, halodetect.com. So there's obviously yep. a link off the, the main website, but um, yep. if someone's interested in that, like you said, I mean, that's got so many sensors in there. And I love the fact that it also has the, uh, the noise and occupancy. I mean, there's, there's, there's a safety, there's an information sheet. It could be downloaded right here in a video. Um, so yeah, you know, a lot of businesses could definitely benefit yep. from having something like this. This is tremendous. Yeah. It's um, crazy. So if anybody's interested, they can reach out to, uh, you know, uh, IP video and the people will talk them through it, provide them with information. It's really an amazing game changing piece of equipment for, for safety and health. You know, it's, it's yeah. Amazing. Healthcare assisted living facilities. That would be a big one, obviously commercial manufacturing. You got, you know, the markets are on there that you guys service. So it's a, that's a fantastic uh, yep. device. I was reading about it early before we came on and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. I'm going to talk to people about this. So you, um, so yeah, amazing stuff. The um, let's see here. You also have a, uh, View scan. What is view scan? Because you got all kinds of different things on here. We'll touch on it real quick here. <laughs> sure. uh, view scan is a is a um, weapons detection system. It looks like a uh, standard metal detector, but it's not. What happens is when somebody walks through it, and you can see a picture of it there. There's a camera attached to it. You can be on scene, or you can be in another room watching it. The throughput on this is very, very fast, uh, about 15 seconds. And what happens, you walk through and it takes a digital image of you and it puts a dot wherever it finds metal on your body. So now instead oh, of having to I search people like these. crazy, you just walk over and you go, oh, let me see what's in that pocket. Let me see what's in this over here. Uh, it's I saw this were, at ISC West. I yes. saw this there. And they were demonstrating how you can tune the... Um, the sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity on it. Yeah. They were like, it'll even detect metal screws in a pair of glasses. Yeah. And I was so, like, what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really great. And what's good is that it's, since it's not a classic metal detector, uh, pregnant women can go through it and people with um, pacemakers and stuff, it doesn't affect them because it's actually sensing uh, around them and it finds the, the uh, different weapons, you know, knives and guns and stuff pop right up. Uh, there's companies that have taken this on uh, for their uh, company where they have employees coming and going and they have saved like a million dollars in stolen products going out the door uh, that people were just stealing off the floor in the receiving department and it shut it down because you can't get through it. It notices they find it and really an amazing product too. 
That's uh, I think that's also the one where they were showing that it'll even detect like things like USB drives. So if you want to secure like yeah. a server room and make sure that somebody isn't downloading data on a USB drive and taking it off site, yep. you can even have this thing. It'll even detect that. So all yeah, of a sudden somebody walks through with a USB drive into a room they're not supposed to be in. It alerts somebody at the monitoring station. The next thing you know, the person's walking down the hall and security walks up and says, uh, sir, come with me. <laughs> can I have that, please? What, what else they can do with that is they can embed this in walls now because a lot of schools yes. want this, but parents don't want their kids to feel like, uh, oh, they're going through a metal detector. They embed it in a wall. And as you walk through it, you get the same readings and somebody in another room can be monitoring it and calling That's, out, hey, stop that. Person, I remember that this. Person. I remember yeah. this from ISC West a couple of years ago. I remember seeing this and, and uh, doing a demonstration with the person that was there. I'll have to see if I have their info, who it was, but because you, you may know them. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, sure I, it depends on what year. I was there a couple of years ago uh, doing this stuff. So it was pretty good. Yeah, that's wild. And then AV vision, true security. So you guys have all kinds of products, yep. you know, for training and consulting and, and all this sort of thing, just different products to keep people safe. And it's all under this, you know, IP video corp, but they're different branches of the company that, that uh, you know, deal with different, sorts of solutions. And so I encourage sure. every, uh, every business out there, every individual, take a look at this because you probably know somebody that can use one or more of the, the products and the solutions that uh, the company supplies. And, uh, and Joe will be more than happy to talk to you about it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. If uh, you call up, uh, you can reach out to me. I can direct you to the right people uh, at IP Video that can walk you through it. Um, so and the yeah, guys are all over social media. Treat. I see that too. You got you know Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, the links are all on the main website, so you can go there. We will make sure that we post those links uh, as well uh, in the, the show notes uh, on the, uh, the YouTube channel. And then, uh, of course, in the, in the audio portion of this, people listening, you know, check out IPVideoCorp.com. Uh, and, of course, like I said, there's the, uh, the separate website for the Halo unit, which is HaloDetect.com. And, you know, take some time, look through that. You know, if you have a company that, that's concerned about any of the things that we're talking about, and then some, uh, you've got a solution right here that can, that can basically, it, it does a heck of a lot of things all on a single device. Absolutely. And you can, they can run in series. So you can, they talk to each other. It's, it's absolutely an amazing uh, suite of, of solutions that they've created here. So I'm very, very proud to be a part of the, uh, part of that organization and bring what I do uh, to safety and security. You know, I bring the human side to it, the teaching, the training, uh, the assessments and whatnot. So it's uh, it's really a, a wonderful thing to spend this part of my life doing something that I really, really believe in and I really, really want to do. And that's keeping people safe because we all have families. We all want to be safe. And I want to yes. do whatever I can to help everybody be safe. That's first and foremost. And so um, threat assessments, I kind of wrap up with this. You uh, So there's all kinds of different hazard threat assessments, all different types, I would assume, natural, man-made, cyber, et cetera. Tell us a little bit yep. about the threat assessments you guys do. When, when people will call, they'll say uh, their business, they're concerned about somebody coming and hurting them, an active assailant or whatever, a school or whatever. The very first place to start uh, to determine your level of security and safety is with a threat assessment. Where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses? Because I got to tell you, there's salesmen out there that will sell you everything and anything, and they make it sound really good. When I was a director of school safety, I had my phone was ringing every day trying to sell me these products. And I would see some of them and say, well, that doesn't really have any application. Oh, but it's really great. It's the best thing on the market. And people buy stuff that they don't need. So an assessment looks through your entire physical, uh, physical location, your policies, your procedures, your buildings. Uh, how you train your people, what they know to do, and then you find those gaps in your security. And then we create a roadmap for you that says, basically, here's where you're really strong. Enhance that. Excellent. Here's where you're weak. Here's where you have to fix, whether it be your, do your doors, your glass, your camera systems, your training, whatever it is where I find weakness. And I give you a roadmap. And, and the first thing that people say, oh, it's so expensive. Well, a couple things here. I give you the first things you can do for low or no money tomorrow things you can change how your processes go to make you safer starting tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Then next year budget for this, next year budget for the next thing. It is also, and for anybody that has a business or a school that's concerned about liability, because we don't like to talk about that, but the reality is something happens at your facility, you're going to get sued. It's going to cost you money. When you go to court and the judge is going to say, could you have anticipated that this would have happened? Nobody in any organization today can say, no, it wouldn't have happened to us. They might right. say the words, but they all know it's not true. They are at risk. 
So when you get a threat assessment done and you something happens, you go to court, your honor, we didn't have a million dollars for brand new doors, but we did these three things and we're budgeting for new doors. That's a liability reduction. That takes some of the zeros off the check you're going to have to write right? Because it's the right thing to do is to be prepared. You can't just say, well, we didn't have money for the assessment. And the assessments are not that expensive, you know, to have somebody like me come in and look it over and give you facts about where you're strong, where you're weak. So you can plug those gaps and keep people safe. So it's it's really awesome. When it comes to a student-based or worker-based assessment, this is creating a team in your facility to teach you how to identify the threat, the level of threat, what it could mean, and then how to react to intervene before that guy comes back and shoots up seven people in the lunchroom or a kid takes a gun out from a backpack and kills kids. We can intervene on these things in many of them, not all of them. Some of them are just going to be surprised. We just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, the signs are right there for us to see. We have to train people how to look for them, how to respond to it. Don't overreact, but don't underreact do the right thing. So those are the, those are the kind of assessments that we do. And now with the cyber world, that's something that we're, we're just starting to get into now because uh, it's something I held off for a while, but it has become so prevalent. Uh, you know, your, your email is the way into your life and people don't understand that they click on something. They get this sense of urgency. You, your credit card bill is over to people panic and they hit that button. And next thing you know, and, and if you do that at work, they're into your work computers So I see all these companies I talk to and they say, how do I tell my employees not to do that? It's well, there's ways to do it. Like, you know, yeah, this is part of what I do to people. You got to training is what do you look at? Training is such a huge part of it. You know, you got to train people on how to react. And, you know, social media is a big problem because of how much information is readily available that people can use that to insert themselves into someone's life. I mean, you can get into a company fairly easily because a lot of public information is out there about a company, say like with a board of directors, you know, you can, somebody goes out and they, they see that here's a whole list of people that, that are on the board of the company. Now that bad actor decides they pick somebody and now they call the company. It doesn't even have to come through an email or anything else. They can just pick up a phone right. and call and say, Hey, you know, Bob on the board of directors, you know, is working on this huge project and he just got a hold of me and he asked me if you guys can provide us with X, Y, and Z before the end of business today. Can you please do that? Because he really needs it. Mm-hmm. Person on the other lines is going, oh, wow, they know Bob on the board. He needs this. I better get on this right away. Not thinking right. it could be a scam. Next thing you right. know, they're like, what email you want me to send that to? Blah, 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 blah. And now all of a sudden that, that information's off and gone and they've been fooled. So there's a lot of things to consider. And uh, as you said, I mean, the cyber attacks and the the uh, the problems with in that realm are just increasing like crazy i'm getting a lot more people asking me about this uh and and helping you know secure their companies from from cyber attack and then how to recover from it because yeah. it's just a matter of when it's going to happen you know it's and, and probably more than once you know you might be attacked today you might be attacked six months down the road and then another couple of months after that as as we see these these attacks ramping up. I, I read a stat the other day. I think cyber attacks in the last few months are up like 800%. Absolutely. 800%. I mean, that's not double. That's ridiculous increases. And so to ignore it is to do so at your own peril and Absolutely. at the potential you know, of having your business go out of business if the wrong right. sort of thing happens. You know, so, when you look at the stuff. digital world, it, it gets as ridiculous as this, where people aren't thinking we have these light bulbs, uh, you know, Henrietta, turn on the lights and this and the other thing. There was a company that I just talked to not, not even a week ago about doing a penetration test for them mm-hmm. about all their employees, how they would react to a, a scam email or something. And they said they had a Bluetooth operated water heater in their fish tank that was on their internet and somebody got in through the heater in the fish tank into their system, got wow. $5 million out of them oh going through the heavens. heater in the fish tank. Right. So if it's online, it's danger. You have to learn how to protect yourself and what to look for and how to secure all of that. And that is the crime of the future. I oh, mean, yes. they, they can go in, they can clean you out in two seconds. It's urgency. Like you said, the board director needs this. Oh, okay. I better give it to him. Right. You, mm-hmm. They create that sense of urgency. Um, you know, we, our older persons and our families, they can be scammed so easy. My father-in-law, God bless him. He's, uh, he calls me up. Hey, where do I get Apple cards? And I said, what do you need Apple cards for? <laughs> the IRS called me and said, I owe them 600 bucks to send them Apple card. No, don't send them Apple cards. That's a uh, scam. IRS doesn't do that. Right. But, but a lot of people scammers don't will do it. Like you said, they, the, they the older them. vulnerable population that doesn't have the knowledge, they're very easily duped. 
Sure. So, well, we're, 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 we're rapidly uh, flew through our time here, Joe. I really appreciate it. Um, it always goes quickly. Do you have any last thoughts that you uh, could share with our audience or key takeaways that sure. you know, would be sort of the, the most important thing you could share that, that could help somebody today? Thank you. I appreciate that. For anybody that's listening or watching, let, let me tell you this. Uh, I think what, what we've said many times today is that we got to change our mindset. You can't be paranoid. You got to be aware and prepare. That's what I call it. Aware and prepare, not paranoid. Uh, when you go somewhere, just take a look around. You got your family with you. You're there by yourself. You, you know, you're at a hotel. Just take a look around and see if you know where the exits are. Do you know the sounds of things? What's the normal sounds in a location? You hear funny popping sounds. Unless you're in a fireworks factory, you should get up and go, right? You got to prepare ourselves mentally. Practice these things. Develop policy and procedure and training. Get yourselves trained. Get a threat assessment on whatever your organization is to find out where you're weak, where you can strengthen yourself up. And I think you start to do you start to do those things. And that's why I say an assessment is the first step, because how can you fix what you don't know is broken? Exactly. Why would you buy stuff that you don't need because somebody sold it to you? Get what you really need. And you do that with a real assessment right from from a professional assessor. And then you go from there. But be aware of your surroundings. Pay attention to things. Uh, and get rid of that thought that it'll never happen here, because uh, there's a group of people right now, some of you might even be listening, that if you're saying that a year from now, you might be saying, I never should have said that, right? And you don't want to do that. You want to be prepared like my friend, Mike, who heard the sounds and took off and he saved himself and his wife. So we can all do these things. So I want to thank you very much for having me on, letting me uh, speak to your audience uh, and to do what I can to keep people safe. If you have any questions, they can reach out to me. I never, ever mind a question. Really appreciate that. So any of our listeners, if you're interested in learning more about Joe or IP Video or the Halo device, you, know, you check out their website, uh, ipvideocorp.com. Uh, the Halo has got its own website, halodetect.com. You can check that out. We'll be putting the links on the show here, notes. Um, companies on social media, you can find them there as well. So thanks, for Joe, for being here. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in to Safety Talk. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and get the latest safety information as well as past episodes at safetytalkpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. You can also watch interviews, of course, on the YouTube channel at safetytalkvideos.com. And until next time, everybody, please stay safe.